What's up, Falcons fam? It's your boy Toby D from Faith Football Fans. And I'm joined by J.R. Clark from Falcon Eye View. And man, listen, man, y'all check J.R. Clark out, my new Falcons family in the brotherhood. And he got, he just put a video up and uh, he gives an interesting take on how he sees and looks at the draft. And man, you, you go check it out. As we're getting ready to jump into the draft ourselves and more than likely talk about some of the players that he talked about on his video uh, and talk about a few more to add on as we get ready to approach the draft coming up in about two weeks. So how's it going, J.R. Clark, man? What's up with you? Oh, man, it's going pretty good, Toby. Going pretty good, just gearing up for this, you know, for the draft that's coming up, really starting to, to dive into the, you know, potential prospects, whether it be, you know, first round type guys or or fourth, fifth round type guys, because, you know, you never know when you're going to pick up the next Richard Sherman in the sixth round or whatever. Or the right. Next Brady. So you can't just focus on the on the first round. But, yeah, just getting into, you know, diving into the prospects and seeing, uh, you know, seeing what turns up. How about you? So uh, I'm doing great, man. I'm already starting to feel like football, man. I've been sitting here believe it or not, watching some Falcons because that's just how much I love to watch my Falcons. I got at least three, four games dbr and I'm actually watching one right now on mute. Uh, the Saints against the Falcons on uh, week three, I believe it was, on Monday Night Football. Uh, as we beat them boys down, you know how it go. Yes, sir. Um, yes. But, man, yeah, man, I'm, I'm just excited. But I got to throw this in here. Before we start talking about the draft, there's a couple of moves. I don't know if you heard or not. Um, that was interesting. Uh, I don't know if you heard of, uh, I think her name was uh, Tiffany Blackman. I think that's her name. Yes, yes. The uh, reporter from the NFL Network. Yeah, man. She had some interesting take on, um, as she was in Flowery Branch this week, on some things that she heard coming down the pike on some moves they're making with moving some of their veteran players around and what they're looking to do uh, in the draft. Now, of course, you know Tommy Dimitrov and them are never going to really give up everything they're doing in the draft. Uh, but she gave some interesting nuggets, and one of them I got to start with is this. Hmm. Uh, Kamal Ishmael moving to yes. linebacker. Now, I, I saw that tweet come across, and I thought to myself, I'm like, you know, that's, that's extremely inter interesting on two fronts. One, you know, they played him at linebacker, you know, quite a bit before he got hurt last year. And I thought he did really well. He plays real good close to the line of scrimmage. You know, he's a much better, you know, read and react kind of player versus, you know, instinct kind, kind of player. So he's not, right. he's not like all-star in coverage, but he's real, real good in run support and, you know, um, things of that nature. So moving into linebacker, to me, speaks more to almost like uh, how they use Philip, Philip Wheeler. Last right, year. right, right. And I don't know if he's – I apologize. I haven't yet to look up to see if he's actually still on the team or not. Um, but if he's not, I would suspect that Ishmael may take over the Philip Wheeler type role um, for the team. But then that brings up a, another interesting thing for the draft. So if you're taking a backup safety and moving him to linebacker, now you've depleted the backup safety depth. Right. So, you know, do we see him, you know, draft another safety, you know, sometime in, in the earlier rounds? So that's something to, you know, to keep an eye on and to, to look out for. Now that's, that's funny you should mention that because one of the things that Tiffany said was that no knock on Ricardo Allen, but they were looking for someone to compliment Keanu Neal. Mm -hmm. um, now, that's very interesting. And the other interesting thing about that, um, I think two weeks ago before she came out with her reports about the safety situation, uh, I guess we're probably a little longer than that after the season had ended. Dan Quinn mentioned Brian Poole competing for that safety spot. See, I, I saw that too. Okay, uh, let me put it this way: I missed Dan Quinn saying that. Okay. I saw a lot of people mentioning it on Twitter, so I went back and found, you know, and found the quote. Cause 
making sure that people weren't just like misquoting, but they, right, they were, right. and, um, but that's interesting too. Cause that dude, he's got some good instincts. He's got some real good instincts. You got to yes, think he does. coming back next year, obviously is true font. So that mm-hmm. gives you true font. That gives you, uh, Alford. That gives you, uh, Jamie Collins. Yeah. And it gives yeah. you a uh, good one. So that it doesn't really leave much room for Brian Poole. Right. But see, here's the interesting thing about that too is, we just spoke about that compliment uh-huh. to Keanu Neal. Both of them played together side by side in college in Florida. Right. So right. this could be interesting. It, they it know each other. It is definitely an interesting dynamic, and that's one thing to definitely watch as we go into camp. You know, where is Brian Poole being played at? Right. You know, if he's being played as, you know, competition for Ricardo Allen, you know, I, one thing I'm definitely loving about this coaching staff versus last coaching staff, when you heard about coach uh, competition in the last coaching staff, it was lip service. Yeah. Completely yeah, right, right. lip service. This coaching staff, it is not lip service. You know, he, he is all about putting the best players he's got on the field, you know, regardless of where you were drafted and so on and so forth. And I so, agree 100%. I agree 100% on that. So that that is an encouraging trait because that was one of the maddening things to me about the Mike Smith regime was that, you know, unless it was a first-round pick, you know, they very rarely had a chance to even get on the field. Right. So when they were pressed in service because somebody went down, they didn't know what the hell they were doing (laughs) or didn't have that live fire experience. So man, that 2013 season was horrific, man. Oh man, don't woo. even get me started. Uh, uh, man, that, mm. woo, boy, that that was a nightmare season, man. Trying to put all those rookies out there and expecting them to be able to play, you know, at starter level. Right. And then not have a a, a truly coherent scheme for them to play in. Right. But, exactly. You know, we could do a whole show on just that. Cause my yeah, guy. yeah, yeah, we could. <laughs> <laughs> but of course, you know, I'm excited. And you know why I'm excited? Mm. Pro days are finally over. <laughs> They're finally over. And you know what that means? You got all this information to deal with now. And yes, and not only that, now it's time for the Atlanta Falcons to get ready to dig, dig deep into. Their um, top 30 mm-hmm. official uh, visit, visit list. So I'm, I'm looking forward to see who these guys are going to be that is going to come in because you know, of course, you can only have the 30 guys to come to your facility. Right. Um, but they just had their local pro day, I think, Wednesday, unfortunately, in all this stormy weather. Uh, you can have an unlimited amount of guys to come and participate, which they did have, um, not only from Georgia, but I think a guy named um, Dalvin Tomlinson mm-hmm. from Alabama. Yep. Um, what this is probably about the third time, which is interesting that they've seen this guy. Um, and I, I, I like the Isaiah McKenzie. Oh, uh, yeah, from Georgia. From Georgia. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. You know, he kind of reminds me. Uh, of someone that could potentially develop into a Taylor Gabriel, man, in my opinion. Right, right. At bare minimum, I think Isaiah McKenzie can can give you a spark at, you know, in your return game. Right. And then potentially, like you said, develop into a Taylor Gabriel-esque player. Right. So, yeah, I mean, that that's, a, that's definitely a name to watch. I've seen that batted around on uh, – Twitter between, you know, a handful of guys I follow. Uh, so, I mean, that's definitely a name to watch. But uh, the one that, that um, on the local pro day that, you know, I, I, I want to go back and look at is this uh, Isaac Rochelle. He's a defensive end, defensive yeah. tackle from Notre yeah. Dame. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. So I, I want to go back and do a little bit, you know, uh, digging on that because I know – They've made the statement more than once that their their focus in this offseason is the offensive and defensive lines. So yeah. any, any of these, you know, defensive end, defensive tackles that we bring in, I'm like, 
I'm almost instantly like drawn to, you know? Right, right, right. And, and I'm just going to tell you that that kind of brings up a sore spot with me hmm. um, with the defensive line and offensive line talk. And I'm going to tell you why, you know, uh, you're listening. I don't know about you, but in the morning I used to listen to uh, 680, the fan. Okay. Um, And they would always have Fran Tarkenton on there. Okay. And he used to wear me out, but he was telling the truth. Um, they used to ask him about how he thinks that Thomas Dimitrov and Mike Smith built the team. And he was like, man, they built the team wrong. You got great skill players, mm -hmm. but you had nobody in the trenches. And it was right. true. And no, very much so. You want to compete, you got to have your trenches built. Yeah, and the key, at least now Dan Quinn and Thomas Dimitrov are focusing on that. Right. The key to any successful team is to control the line of scrimmage. And that's on both sides of the ball. Exactly. If you control the line of scrimmage, you have a far better chance of winning the game. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yes. But the, the part that got, that got me, and, and I wrote a, a post about this oh, last year around this time. But, uh, if, you know, people like to dog on Dimitrov. But if this, if this has showed you anything, is that Dimitrov will get the players that his coach wants. Exactly. So they're towards the you know middle and end of, of the Mike Smith era. I don't think Mike Smith really even knew what he wanted. He knew, you know, so after that Green Bay trouncing in the playoffs, it was a, well, we need a high-powered offense. So built a high-powered offense. And, mm -hmm. you know, but then the line went down. So, you know, you know Dimitrov gets a lot of – a lot of flack from the fans and stuff like that. But to me, he does what a general manager is supposed to do. He gets with the coaches, he listens to his coaches, and he gets the players that his coaches want. Right. Now I'm I'm not I'm not gonna lie. I was on that I was on that wagon of get rid of this man. <laughs> <laughs> but Dan Quinn knows more than I do and he was right to keep this job to keep this guy, man. I mean, their, their relationship right now, man, it, it, they're both looking like geniuses right now. And yeah, they could I mean, be the last guys standing in this division. I hate to say it. Could very well could be. <laughs> I mean, you know, because you, you got to think that if if Quinn didn't want to work with Dimitrov, Dimitrov wouldn't be here. Right. right? Yep. And I think that even would have been on, you know, Dimitrov himself probably would have been like, well, I'm out, you know. Because it just shows, in, in my opinion, this shows the type of general manager that he really is. You right. know, he works hand in hand with his coaches and gets what his coaches want. So, and he does the best, you know, the best that he that is available for him. And he does a real good job with the cap situation and not really hamstringing us, a right. la, you know, the Jets and. You know, a la the uh, who who else is in like well, you know, New Orleans is in cat hell. Mm. You know, so you know, Dimitrov does a real good job with the numbers. You know, locking up you know key guys before they ever get to market. So that's important. So, but yeah, so that's that's my feelings on that. I, th I think he does a uh, uh, I think he does the job he's supposed to do. So. So with that being said, now I think we can finally get into this draft talk. There you go. I, I listened to your video. I went and watched it. And uh, I, I love your take on how you see things and as far as, you know, the mock drafts and things like that. But I heard uh, a few players that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Now, so far, we have not brought any of those guys in. We have at least two weeks to see if we are going to bring any of those guys in. But you mentioned about T.J. Watt. Yeah. How do you really feel about him? I think T.J. Watt can be a, a good player. He could be a potentially great player. Uh, you know, the, the games that I watched, you know, I tried to watch games where Wisconsin played – you know, uh, similar or upper echelon talent mm -hmm. to really gauge, you know, how he plays. Because anybody can play – anybody can look great against, you know, inferior talent. 
Right. So I tried to watch at least, you know, same level or higher. And what I saw with T.J. Watt is a guy who doesn't stop. You know, he, he plays all the way through, you know, all the way through the whistle, so to speak, and and is a very, you know, athletic outside linebacker. The only qualms I have really is if we draft a guy like that, every game I watched, he he, he never put his hand in the dirt. Okay. Like I never saw him put his hand in the dirt. He ran he rushed from a two, you know, two point stance, right. you know, standing up like like your typical outside linebacker does. So I don't know if that's something – I'm sure that's something he can do. But that's a different launch point. And you take a guy who's used to rushing standing up and tell him to put his hand in the dirt, it's going to take him a little while to adjust. Right. But, uh, but if you were to draft somebody like that and plug him in plug him in at that Leo position, you know, especially the Leo position in, in the nickel even to begin with. Exactly. You know, I, I think he could fare, you know, pretty well. You you line him up out wide, and when you like, you kick, you know, Claiborne down to defensive tackle. Let Claiborne occupy potentially occupy the left tackle, and you know, then hopefully you get T.J. Watt either coming free or only having to deal with a tight end or a running back. You know, so hey, he's very athletic. Uh, that much I liked. Yeah, you know, he, he ran, that. You know, he ran a lot of uh, – he ran a good bit of running backs down from the backside of the play, dropped them for losses or very small gains. Uh, saw him do, you know, pick six, which is always encouraging to see from oh. the defensive lineman. You know? Yeah, yeah. Man, when I saw Deion Jones do that, oh. Uh, oh. In in his videos, man, <laughs> I was like, whoo yeah, yeah, and and the beautiful part about it, it translated into the game exactly. in the NFL. Exactly. <laughs> now, you know, do I do I think you know T.J. Watt could come in and be our premier pass rusher? I don't know if he'd ever be the premier pass rusher, but he could come in and take enough heat off of Vic Beasley to make Vic Beasley even better. Which right. you know what you're looking for that that bookend. You know, pass rush. If you only have Big Beasley, it ain't gonna take long for teams to just neutralize Big Beasley, which, if you saw, kind of happened towards the end of the year. Right in the playoffs, especially. Uh-huh. Like, okay, we got to stop this guy. Yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and call it. There ain't too many guys out on this field that you know can be unstopped all the time. Right. You know, you only got a very few of them. You know, Julius Peppers in his prime. You know, J.J. Watt in his prime. You know, uh, Vaughn Miller. Even even Vaughn Miller can't handle double teams all game long. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So, you're right. you know, Vaughn Miller really exploded when he had DeMarcus Ware and Elvis Doom. You know, so, you, you know, you've got to find that other guy. And that's the one thing since I've been watching the Falcons we haven't really had, which is two threatening pass rushers on the field at the same time. Yeah, that's that's um. It's been a long time. Uh, we we had something to that effect back when we went to the first Super Bowl. Um, uh, when Chuck Smith was here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think you know guys like Patrick Kearney and, and guys like that was all on the team. I think at that time, but we haven't really had anything solid like that since. Right. Uh, in my opinion, now if somebody listening to this. Uh, can go back into their memory banks and, and tell us that, you know, somewhere where we've had that two dominant guys on either side, then let us know. Yeah, but, for uh, sure. I, I, I definitely would like to see where we're going. Now, I'm just going to tell you, because uh, I, I listened to your video again, and, and um, now we talked before we actually started doing this, you said that something interesting that T.J. Watt, nor – Charles Harris, which is another guy that I, I like from Missouri, yep. uh, have been invited yet to the Falcons facility. And you and you made an interesting point on why that might be uh, if this should play out these next two weeks. So if you don't mind, I would like for you to share that, uh, what you was telling me about your theory on why you feel that may be why they're not invited yet. 
I, I really feel like that if if Forrest Lamp or Cam Robertson is there at 31, mm-hmm. I really feel like that's who we're taking. Okay. I really feel like that they're putting a serious priority in replacing uh, Chris Chester, who just retired. Okay. You know, I don't think they just I don't think they just want to plug in anybody. Right. They saw the difference of having just anybody plugged in the first year Quinn was there to having quality talent all the way across the line this past year and the difference okay. that it made. Yeah. Okay. I so it. if I, I really believe that if Forrest Lamp or Cam Robertson is sitting there at 31, that that's going to be our first round pick. Now you couple that with the fact that, uh, a lot of the the quote unquote experts, you know, the guys who get paid to do this for a living, are yeah. saying yeah. that this is a, a deep draft for defensive line. Like that's you know, edge rushers, defensive tackles, defensive ends, all that. Right. But this is a real deep draft. They may not feel like they need to grab, you know, an edge rusher in the first round, especially if that edge rusher is going to come in and be the Leo. Right. Because right. the Leo doesn't play. Isn't on the field, you know, the entire time. They're not a three-down player, you know. And especially as much as Dan Quinn likes to to shift his, you know, defensive line and rotations and all that other stuff, it's really hard to say who's really a starter, you know, and who's really going to get a ton of snaps. So, um, you know, you got the guy out of. Now you said his name earlier, so I'm going to ask you to say it again because I'll butcher it. But you got the guy out of Villanova. Oh, man, one of my favorite, favorite guys, man, Tonar Passion. Yes, Passion. Oh, my goodness, man. This guy has a lot of upside, man. And, and, and I'm going to tell you, a lot of people are uh, comparing him to Marquise Hunt, uh, who got drafted by the Cincinnati Bengals, who hadn't turned out to be much of anything, unfortunately. But I'm I'm going to go – uh, a little bit more on the danger side here. I'm going to say he reminds me more of Ziggy Ansa. Uh, yeah. And I'm going to tell you why, because they have similar backgrounds where they haven't had a lot of football experience. They started playing football very late in the game. Uh, they have a lot of upside to the fact that you always hear Dan Quinn saying about development and how they make it bring something out of you that you didn't even know you had. He's one of those type of players. Uh, and, and Dan Quinn has already made it known that it's no secret that he loves the possibilities of this guy. And he could very easily come off that board somewhere in that second and third round for the Atlanta Falcons. It wouldn't, it wouldn't shock me one bit. If, if we pull a guard in the first round, your second, third round is going to be, you know, either that Passion or uh, Derek Rivers out of Youngstown. Right. You know, those so far are two pass rushers that they've had uh, private workouts with, I believe. I know yeah, have, yeah. have had, according to uh, uh, Walter Football, they've had a workout with Passion, and they've had a workout with Derek Rivers. Right, it's so, true. Um, those are two names. But then again, you also got to think something else to, to – remember in uh in times like this is that those guys who like pass rushers who are potential first rounders a lot of times teams won't even have a workout with them you know because you know because of their talent you know it's it's an easy you know easy pick in the sense of okay we know what this guy is there's there's enough film against enough high level competition that we feel comfortable you know, taking it regardless. Now, let me tell you about Passion. I, 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 I watch this guy, and I know he comes from a small school just like Derrick Rivers does. What I like about him is this guy is as comfortable rushing from one side as he is the other, man. Basically, he's like even with it. He can rush from the right side. He can rush from the left side. And what really got me was, I think I was watching the game where he was playing against South Dakota. Uh-huh. Um, dude had banged his thumb up real bad, so he had to basically come out of the game. 
he goes back in the game with what we normally would call look like a club on his hand. <laughs> right, right. And he is still wreaking havoc. Oh, yeah. He was – what you want to see out of a small school prospect is that, you know, that he dominates his competition. Exactly. And, and, and if a small school prospect looks like, you know, a man amongst boys, you, you tend to – feel better about him, you know, translating, a la uh, Khalil Mack from a few years back. You know, played in Buffalo and then, you know, dominated Buffalo, had one game against Ohio. Mm -hmm. That was like the the stiffest competition that he faced and absolutely right. dominated that game as well. They ended up exactly. losing, but he dominated. So that led to, I think he got picked, what, Second or third overall, maybe even fourth overall. He went. He actually went. He went fifth overall to the yeah. Raiders right before we picked Jake Matthews. Yes, because I was me and uh me and my best friend. We get together and watch, you know, we and have a draft party, and you know, we were sitting there when Khalil Mack got picked. We both like groaned, like, "Damn, that was yep. so close!" You know, the Raiders took him right before, but I oh. think we already had our. I said on Jake Matthews. I believe so. so. I believe so. Um, now, the other thing about Passion that I like, I guess you can tell that I really like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. I haven't had a chance to watch a ton on him, so I'm glad that you have. So, Well, the well, dude has almost 36-inch arm length. Oh, yes. And, 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 and to tack on to that with an extra bonus, almost 11-inch hands. Good. Oh, he yeah, uh, he is definitely <laughs> definitely a physical specimen. <laughs> like I let me put it to you like this: the one video I watched I, um, was a, the college breakdown against uh, I think St. Francis. I think is who they were playing. Yeah, and uh, they didn't even have to put the little arrow behind him. <laughs> I didn't even know what his number was, and I was like, "That's the dude right there." Like I can I can tell you that that's the dude because he doesn't look like he belongs on that defensive line. He looks like right. he belongs on, you know, uh, Alabama's defensive line or Georgia's <laughs> defensive line. Does not look like he belongs on Villanova's defensive line. Well, if you want to know if he can handle top competition, I don't know if you caught the senior bowl this year. No, I missed out on it. Oh, man. I, I mean, you can hear Mike Mayock, man. He, he was like salivating over this guy. He was dominating in practice, and he had a pretty good senior bowl game. I watched that game, and it was a lot of guys in there that um, we know about, Derrick Rivers being one of them, who also had a, a great senior bowl game. Um, not, to, not to forget also her son, Reddick. Yes. Uh, who also had a workout for the Atlanta Falcons early on during the pro days. Yeah, I've been seeing Hassan Reddick being mocked in the mid-first round. Yeah, he's going like, top 15. Uh, yeah, to like Indy. <laughs> so it's – like, you know, kind of like what I explained in my, my video, you know, you know, quick recap, so to speak, is, is I look at a lot of a lot of mock drafts. And, right. you know, I kind of take that as a – then I kind of like average it out. You know what I'm saying? And so I see where – you know, I try to, you know, obviously identify where we're picking, see the talent that is around where we're picking, and kind of go from there. So as soon as I identified that Hassan Reddick was getting – mocked anywhere from you know 10 to like 17 i was like well he'll probably be gone before we get there so unless we do something crazy like trading up which i i hope they don't do that if they do that it probably would be for forest lamp depending on how far forest lamp goes down now you know word is, is that this is not a strong uh o-line class this year uh, -uh. uh so if 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 Forest Lamp slips down there in the, in the mid twenties, they may jump for him, um, a little bit and, and and go ahead and take him. But I mean, we'll see how it plays out, man. I mean, um, it's definitely going to be interesting, man, because you think you know who the Falcons are going to get, and then it turns around they don't get anybody that you think, except yeah. maybe a few people. Yeah. Um, but I'm feeling real strong about that Tonal Passion coming off that board, but you're going to have to grab him 
probably, unfortunately, I, I don't know if you agree with this, but you may have to take him with that 63rd pick before I, I you get to that third round. Right. I was, that's what I was just – I actually agree with you on that. Okay. If they, if they don't grab – okay, if it goes like this, if they end up with, with Lamp in the first round, if they don't grab Passion in the second round, it's probably going to be, you know, Rivers or, um, you know, somebody else in the third round. Right. Because right? I, I don't see Passion making it out of the second round. His measurables say that he should be taken, you know, late second round, early third round, which that right. tends to translate into mid-second round, <laughs> end of second round, mm-hmm. you know, is, is what I have seen. So, yeah, if, if we pull – if we get Lamp or if we get a guard in the first round, I would highly, I would highly anticipate them taking – uh, pass rusher in the second round is, is the now, way I feel about it. Oh, excuse me. Now, now I don't know if you had a chance to watch um the guy from Ohio, Terrell Basham yet. No, I've heard his name being batted around. I haven't watched him yet. Well, I can tell you this much. I, you know, I, I talked about this about the explosion numbers on one of my videos, but um his and not just him. A lot of the guys. Their explosion number doesn't do them any justice because it's very deceiving. They have low explosion numbers. Um, I'm always looking for that 70 or greater. Uh, when you when you take their bench press and the vertical jump and the broad jump and put it together uh, and add them up and you get a 70 or better, I've, I've been taught that these guys can really handle themselves on the front line. Hmm. Now, unfortunately for him, it's – it's very low. It's, it's like a 56.4. But when you watch him, he looks much more explosive than that number indicates. And the dude can play just like Passion can, right to left. And you know mm. Dan Quinn could play, have a field day with a guy like that, moving him and Beasley Big around. Beasley around. Yeah. Well, see, <laughs> yeah, it, the, way I, the way I feel about it is – is numbers and measurables are are great tools, but if you don't apply that to tape, you don't get the whole story. Right. Just like you know, if you don't, if you all you do is watch tape and you don't look at measurables, you know, you're not going to get the whole story. Exactly. You know, some guys are. You know, you've heard the term workout warrior. <laughs> you know, a la Jamal Anderson of a few years ago. Yeah. You know, dude kills it at the combine. Works out like a gym rat, just nuts, jumps out of the gym. <laughs> but turn the lights come on and there ain't nothing there. Nope. So, you know, you can't – you, you got to – the way I've I heard Mayock say it many times is that the measurables should back up the tape or yeah. the tape wow. should back up the measurables. You know, if, if some dude looks like a beast – and you know, test out like a beast, but you don't see it on game film. Then I, you know, I kind of steer clear. But you know, if you got a guy who doesn't necessarily test well, but you put it on his game film and he plays like a monster. Oh man, he and he you know, looks good. Man, right, he right. he looks good, man. I, and he has the measurables too. I think he almost had like a. I think he had like a, almost a thirty-four inch arm length, and and almost the same thing. Almost close to eleven inch hands. Man, he's six four, so like two seventy, and the dude can move. Man, he is very violent up front. Like I said, that 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 explosion number. He looks nothing like that slow of that explosion number. I, I, I love watching him, man. You you got to check him out. If you haven't checked him out already, he's a guy that's supposed to um, – Brian Young is supposed to go up to Ohio and work him out Tuesday. Okay. Uh, according to um, D. Orlando Ledbetter, and they're supposed to bring him in as one of their official top 30 visits on Friday. Okay. Okay, good. See, see there again, to me, is lining up. Like, they're hunting a guard in the first round. Yeah. I mean, you look at who they're bringing in, who they're wanting to take closer looks at. Yeah. It's your day two and day three, you know, pass rushers, defensive linemen. 
you know, and I just, I got that sneaky feeling. Of course, I get this feeling after I put up that video and put, <laughs> put TJ Watt all out there like I'm all confident that it's TJ Watt. And put that out there and then start doing some more digging. And I'm like, man, they're going guard in the first round. Yeah, it, it's starting to look that way, man. It really, it really, but yeah. I feel like, but with that being said, I feel like if Forrest Lamp is gone and, you know, Cam Robertson's gone and you got, you know, TJ Watt or Charles Harrison there, I believe they'll take him, you know, they'll, they'll grab them up. Right. Cause they've done a lot of, you know, private or, you know, local workouts and stuff like that with, you know, offensive tackles and, um, you know, offensive guards and stuff like that. So it wouldn't, I wouldn't be totally surprised if, uh, uh, if they, you know, ended up taking a guard in the second round. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised about that either, nor would I be mad. You got to protect um, your franchise quarterback. Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, and, and you want to keep this offense, especially when you've changed offensive coordinators, um, you want to make sure you provide him with the best uh, possible O-line that you can to be able to do the things that he's going to want to do. Um, that may be a little different from Kyle Shanahan. Uh, many people think we're going to take a huge step back because Kyle is gone. I, I just don't see it. I, I think I don't see us being a historically great team like we were last season, but I, I don't see us going back that much. No, I mean, you. it's hard to catch lightning in a, in a bottle twice. But the thing, the big difference between the jump of the first season and the second season with Shanahan was – you know Matt Ryan's comprehension, understanding, and comfort and comfort level with the offense. That's not going to go away. You know that doesn't go away just because Shanahan left. So now it can be more of of. Uh, oh crap. Is my I don't know how I'm sounding. I just got a bad signal. Anyway, uh, uh -oh, I think I lost. Yep. You there? You there? You back? Yep. What's up? Hey, man, that might be our cue. That might be. <laughs> Starting to have a little bit of technical difficulty. We could talk about the Falcons all day because <laughs> that's just what we do. That's it. But I do want to leave it right there where we.